Back in the 19th century, before baking powder and other rising agents became popular, you had to put in some serious elbow grease if you wanted a fluffy, airy dough to emerge from the oven. And one of the most labor-intensive recipes of the era was basically America's first biscuit, the iconic beaten biscuit. These tender, flaky, hardtack rolls were often made by enslaved cooks and domestic servants who would spend as much as an hour creating delicate layers in the dough by whacking it with whatever they had around. Rolling pins, axe handles, hammers, you name it. As a result, these beaten biscuits took immense skill and became a culinary delicacy, especially in the South. And at the turn of the 20th century, no beaten biscuits were as famous in Columbia, Missouri, as Annie Fisher's. It was not a party of any status if Annie Fisher wasn't cooking honey. Serving Annie Fisher's beaten biscuits was such a hostess flex that today Annie Fisher is still regarded as Columbia's most successful independent businesswoman. I mean, she just got on a train and went to St. Louis and did it. That means she's persistent and she's not going to let any obstacles stop her. She was some kind of woman. And yet for decades, Annie Fisher's story was mostly hidden in her hometown. All traces of her erased. That is, until a few women revived her story. This is A People's History of Kansas City. I'm Suzanne Hogan. And on this episode, fame, fortune, and biscuits. People should understand those were not available a decade ago, two decades ago, and make sure that that never happens again. A lot of places in Columbia are just markers. I mean, that's kind of why I'm meeting with you. So producer Mackenzie Martin is the one who first taught me about Beaten Biscuits and Annie Fisher, and how Fisher's story has come to mean very distinct things to all the champions who are making sure her story is not forgotten, which it almost was. Here's Mackenzie. These days, the kind of success that culinary entrepreneur Annie Fisher enjoyed a century ago might be partly attributed to an impressive marketing plan, investors, or at the very least, access to a bank loan. But here's the thing about Annie Fisher. As a black woman in Jim Crow, Missouri, she didn't really have access to those advantages, and yet she amassed a fortune anyway. And the person who has probably done the most to piece together how she did it is Verna LeBoy. That woman had every opportunity to fail and didn't. It's a huge thanks to her work and additional research by historian Mary Beth Brown that we have a semi-complete picture of who Annie Fisher was. Verna's interest in Annie Fisher started about 30 years ago when she first moved to Columbia. She was at this luncheon when someone told her offhand that a number of historical women were being inducted into the Boone County Hall of Fame, including Annie Fisher. I was told that I have the stature of Annie Fisher, that she was a tall healthy woman like myself. They needed reenactors for the event. Are you an actress, they asked her. And me being the drama queen that I am, it was like, of course, how could you tell? To prepare for the role, Verna started asking about Fisher around town. But not much was known in the 1990s about the biscuit queen of mid-Missouri. So I would stop old people in the grocery store <laughs> and introduce myself And Verna didn't stop after the induction. She was hooked. It's almost like her story captivated my soul. She's basically been giving historical presentations about Fisher's life, while dressed in her signature checked apron and high neck blouse, ever since. It's important to Verna, as a black woman, that kids today know who Annie Fisher was. So much of the history they learned from this time period, she says, is about slavery. But Fisher's story is about a successful black businesswoman who started a bustling catering enterprise, almost completely on her own. That's why Verna takes vacation time from her day job in public health to present at school assemblies. She wants to push these kids to dream big, like Fisher did. Annie Fisher was born into a big family in Columbia in 1867, two years after the Civil War ended. Her parents, Robert and Charlotte Knowles, were born enslaved. And from an early age, she worked. At first in the fields, then in houses rocking cradles for white families. When the babies were sleeping, though, she'd go and hang out with the cooks. 
because that was where all the magic was happening, the smells, the aromas. Hospitality-adjacent roles were one of the few career paths open to women back then, black or white. And for Fisher, the kitchen became a place of creative expression. She was good at it. A common refrain even started, just let Annie do the cooking. In her 20s, she went to work at the Sigma Alpha Epsilon Fraternity House at the University of Missouri, and later for a prominent family in town, where one day her employer, a white lady, was like, Annie, why don't you go into the catering business? According to a speech Fisher gave to the National Negro Business League, she immediately realized that this could be a very financially lucrative move, if she could get the support of this woman and her white friends. So she went for it. She began small, just selling hot rolls at first. Then she added pies, cakes, and what became her claim to fame, beaten biscuits. For 10 cents a dozen, about $3 today. Her biscuits were described as creamy, fluffy, and flaky. So I don't know about somebody else's grandma's biscuits. I know the Annie's were right on. It wasn't long before newspapers started calling her the best cook in Columbia. And I cannot stress enough what a big deal this was. What bank was giving her loans to do this, okay? Not a one. There were other black female cooks in Columbia at this time, but Missouri historian Bridget Haney says she hasn't seen anyone even remotely close to the scale of Annie Fisher. She speculates Fisher's success was due to a few things. Talent, glowing newspaper profiles, inclusion in city directories, word-of-mouth advertising, simply being in the right place at the right time, and this last one is important, being considered, quote, respectable, which Bridget says was a combination of hardworking, reliable, and law-abiding. All of these were measures of admiration back then, certainly, but highly racialized and condescending ones from a 21st century perspective. And remember, beaten biscuits were a tricky delicacy. Not just anyone could make them. Fisher shared her recipe far and wide, but she would tell reporters with a smile that the reason people couldn't duplicate them was that she couldn't teach the common sense required to make them. There were just five ingredients. One quart flour, one third cup lard, and one third cup butter to keep them light. One cup sweetened water to keep them from spoiling. Salt to taste. And quote, plenty of elbow grease. Fisher recommended going at it from the shoulder and working the dough for 15 minutes until it was as stiff as pie crust. Her work was made easier, thankfully, with the invention of a machine called the Beaten Biscuit Brake, manufactured by Jay DeMuth of nearby St. Joseph, Missouri. It looks kind of like a sewing machine table to me. Verna naturally owns one of these and explained to me how it works. But it has ringer washer rollers on the top of it. To the uninitiated, it kind of looks like a pasta machine. You turn a hand crank to make the rollers turn. Verna also showed me how Fisher engineered her own biscuit cutter, which is basically a cookie cutter with six nails, allowing Fisher to cut a perfectly round biscuit and poke six holes in the top in one fail swoop. And there's a hole on the side. So when she cut down on the dough, air escaped. And the nails in the lid would lift up all the layers, the stack of dough. And her biscuits ultimately served as a gateway into her entire menu. Chipped potatoes, fruitcake, roast chicken, salads, ice cream. Suffice to say, word of Annie Fisher quickly spread across the state. No function was too large for her to cater. I mean, people changed their wedding dates, their debutante party dates, so that Annie could accommodate them. It was not a party of any status if Annie Fisher wasn't cooking honey. Her biscuits were even on the table in 1911 when President William Taft visited the Missouri State Fair in Sedalia. To celebrate her growing success, she designed and bankrolled the building of a 14-room mansion near the Sharp End, a historically black business district. She even lived in a tent on the property while it was built to make sure it was to her exact specifications. Fisher was married briefly to a reverend, William Fisher, but according to newspaper reports, she filed for divorce and even offered her husband a cash settlement not to contest it. There was a journalist once that said Annie was excellent at making two kinds of dough, the one that rises for biscuits and the other one that makes bank accounts fat. 
By this time, Fisher was regularly cooking for three or four hundred guests, with only the help of her daughter Lucille. And in the 1920s, her success was being heralded in newspapers across the country, with headlines like, Road to Fortune, Paved with Beaten Biscuit. She was even featured in the National Cyclopedia of the Colored Race, alongside other famed entrepreneurs of the era, like Madam C.J. Walker, the hair care pioneer who became the first black female millionaire in America. In addition to catering, Fisher also ran a successful mail-order business, shipping her biscuits to both coasts and supposedly some movie stars. She mail-ordered her biscuits to Wall Street. By 1926, at age 58, Annie Fisher had made more than enough money to retire. But instead, she started a restaurant specializing in chicken dinners. She built the Wayside Inn on a farm where her parents had lived, just outside of Columbia. Inside, the floors were polished and the house was tastefully furnished with elaborate rugs, mahogany furniture, and leather. The restaurant was well patronized by a white clientele. But it wasn't a wild party spot or anything. Dancing and alcohol were strictly forbidden. It was prohibition, after all. And Fisher told a reporter at the time that the house had been sprinkled with holy water. Part of the mystique of Annie Fisher back then, and today, honestly, is how tight-lipped she was about her success. Nosy people always asked how much money she had, but she was coy. She'd only ever say something along the lines of having done pretty well for herself. She was very sassy in a very graceful way. In 1929, it was estimated that her fortune was worth between $100,000 and $150,000, which is akin to about $2 million today. And it wasn't just biscuit money lining her pockets. She also became something of a real estate mogul. In addition to her two mansions, she owned 18 smaller houses around town that she rented out during a time when it was notoriously difficult for Black Americans to own homes. She was an enterprise. Annie Fisher Enterprise, that's what it was. It wasn't easy. Among other things, this year marks the tragic 100th anniversary in Columbia of the lynching of James T. Scott, a Black man hung by a mob in 1923 after a white girl falsely accused him of assault. What makes Fisher's success all the more extraordinary is that she built her biscuit empire in spite of open bigotry and violence. And she somehow did it with a sense of humor. One of the stories everyone tells is about this one time when she asked the University of Missouri if she could borrow silverware and china to cater a banquet for a whopping 700 people. It had never been a problem in the past, but... There was a new sheriff in town, and he told her she could no longer have access to the supplies because it belonged to the university. Time was short, but she hurried onto a train, traveled 125 miles to St. Louis, rented everything she needed, came back, served the banquet, and brought in $1,300. And she vowed she would never be in that position again. She eventually owned more china, more silver, more linens than anyone in Boone County. And when she wasn't using all her supplies, she rented them out. Fisher herself only ever got a third grade education, but using her catering profits, she put her daughter through college and a music conservatory. It's like painful things happened and something beautiful came out of it. And I think that's the way life happens for a lot of us. You'd think, hearing all this, that Fisher would have been long celebrated. But her legacy in Columbia quickly vanished after her death in 1938 at age 70. Her only daughter, Lucille, supposedly never had any children. I found a cousin of hers here. And when I called the cousin to get information about the family, she knew nothing about Annie Fisher. Columbia has done more to recognize Fisher in recent years. One of the local food pantries is now named for her. But how to protect Fisher's legacy has also become a point of tension in town. In 2011, community leader Sheila Ruffin campaigned for months to preserve Fisher's fine dining restaurant, The Wayside Inn. She wanted it to stand as a testament to Black achievement in town. Made a website, and I made letters, and 
pamphlets to pass out about the Annie Fisher House project. I did all those things. But in the end, Sheila was unable to raise enough money and community support to save it. The owners tore it down. More than a decade later, it's still hard for Sheila to go near that part of town. It's just still overwhelming. I felt like I failed, and I can't get over that. An African-American heritage trail marker sits near the location of Fisher's first mansion, but that one's no longer standing either. It was demolished in 1961 during so-called urban renewal, a period when the federal government paid cities across the country to tear down neighborhoods they argued were blighted. Hundreds of thousands of people were forced out of their homes, mostly people of color. Increasingly, we are seeing large-scale demolition as the first step in building modern cities. It means Negro removal. That is what it means. And the federal government is is an accomplice to this fact. In Fisher's former neighborhood alone, an estimated 303 families of color were displaced in the 1960s. The only real place to remember her now is Memorial Park Cemetery. When Sheila Ruffin first came here, to Fisher's grave, the headstone was covered in moss and standing water. But she complained to the cemetery, and they cleaned it up. Now, people even come here sometimes and pay their respects. For me, standing here, I can't help but think about how outrageous it is that this is one of the only tangible markers left of a woman who created so much. What could it have been like if Columbia had started to celebrate Annie Fisher sooner? Hey there, it's Suzanne. I hope you're enjoying this episode about Annie Fisher. You should know it's part of a collaboration with the James Beard award-winning podcast, Gravy, an awesome show from our friends over at Southern Foodways Alliance and distributed by APT Podcast Studios. Gravy shares stories of the changing American South through the foods we eat. And I'd strongly suggest their recent episode on the global domination of KFC, Kentucky Fried Chicken, and how it became one of the most popular restaurant chains in China. Follow Gravy on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite listening app. And tell them we sent you. Food writer Donna Battle Pierce was just a kid in the 1950s when her family moved to Columbia, Missouri. Her parents, Muriel and Elia Battle, were both distinguished black educators. And the landmark case, Brown v. Board of Education, had just outlawed segregation in schools. And their purpose of coming down was to integrate. When Donna and her siblings integrated Grant Elementary School, their parents called them their brave little soldiers of integration. But it was still very much the Jim Crow era. The teacher got up in my classroom and said, if you don't want to play with Donna, you don't have to. Back then, Donna says knowing the story of Annie Fisher would have been deeply empowering. And yet, Donna never learned about Fisher in school. Instead, she soaked up black culture in the pages of Ebony magazine. Ebony and Jet have risen to the top of their field, the newest additions to the Negro press. I grew up in two worlds. I grew up loving my culture and appreciating so many different things about it, but not sharing it with white people who totally didn't understand it. As a teen, Donna became politically active, protesting the Vietnam War with fellow students. Then in college, she took her first Black Studies course and became fascinated. But it wasn't until the 90s that Donna finally learned about Annie Fisher. She was living in San Francisco then, but was in Columbia visiting her parents when she saw none other than Verna LeBoy S. Fisher on television. You see me as a maid-ish type woman, a cook type woman, that's fine. I'm going to be the best at it, and you're going to pay me for it. And I, I said, what the heck is this? How is it possible that this woman was in my community? Donna discovered she had a lot in common with Annie Fisher. They both loved cooking. They were both members of St. Paul AME Church. An old family friend of Donna's had even baked biscuits with Fisher. I I just could not believe that I had missed this part of Columbia's history. Donna even realized that, as a teen, she had coveted Fisher's Wayside Inn, 
which by that time was no longer a restaurant. It was just a beautiful house across from the Sky High Drive-In where she'd go with friends. I had no idea that a Black woman had lived there and had built that house. Then, in 1997, Donna got the incredible opportunity to tour Fisher's home before it was torn down. To this day, she remembers it clearly, mainly the small kitchen where Fisher made thousands of beaten biscuits. It had such a, a clean, creative feel to it. And you could see that part of her imagining things and making things okay and how proud she must have been of that. It was almost there as a monument to her. Of course, this was 26 years ago, and it's not there anymore, but it left an impression. It's always, since then, made me feel how important it is to uncover these people. So many things kind of slip away. And this Annie Fisher is one person who really shouldn't slip away. Five years after this moment, Donna Battle Pierce became the assistant food editor and test kitchen director for the Chicago Tribune. And in that role, and all of her roles since, she's championed Black culinary visionaries that have mostly been left out of history so that their knowledge can be passed down to future generations. She writes about them, gives presentations about them. In addition to Annie Fisher, there's Frida DeKnight, Ebony Magazine's first food editor, and hundreds more in cities and towns across America. These are the nuances that you grow up with. All these things I've told you about are all deep inside of me. And that's the kind of thing that Annie Fisher understood. And yet she decided to walk the way of that confident businesswoman. And I'm, I'm very proud to have her having been from Columbia. Today, Donna's a collector of family recipes and vintage cookbooks. She'd love it if Columbia would honor Annie Fisher with a museum one day. But until then, the best way she knows to keep Fisher's memory alive is by making her biscuits. But this recipe's been sort of modified, and this is a real Southern tradition. Though her testing has found a high-quality food processor works just as well as an old-fashioned biscuit break. There's just nothing any better in the world than a thin slice of country ham on a beaten biscuit. Donna says she'll always wish she had known about Annie Fisher sooner. But thanks to people like historical reenactor Vernal LeBoy and community leader Sheila Ruffin, things are different in Colombia now. And it's about time, Donna says, for more kids in Colombia to see themselves reflected in their city's history. People's History of Kansas City is a production from KCUR Studios. It's hosted by me, Suzanne Hogan. Our senior producer is Mackenzie Martin, who reported, produced, and mixed this episode in collaboration with Gravy Podcast from the Southern Foodways Alliance, with editing by Sarah Camp Milam, Olivia Terencio, Luke Martin, and me. Music this episode from Billy Murray, Fats Waller, Bessie Smith, James Brown, The Temptations, and Blue Dot Sessions. And you heard archival audio from The Dynamic American City, The Negro, and The American Promise, and Johnson Publishing. Special thanks for this episode to historian Mary Beth Brown, historian Bridget Haney, Vox Magazine, and the Renewing Inequality Project at University of Richmond. You can keep in touch with us by joining our Facebook group or shooting us an email at peopleshistorykc at kcur.org. Also, if you're a fan of the show, share this episode with a friend or leave us a rating and write a review. It really does help out. And if you're hungry for more Missouri food stories, another great episode to check out this time of year is a toast to the birthplace of sliced bread. Long story short, it's all about how a Missouri town almost forgot it invented the greatest thing since anything. All right, that's it. Please stay tuned. You'll be hearing from us again real soon. Until then, I'm Suzanne Hogan. Take care and thanks for listening.